Transhumanism. You want to live forever? The biologist Julian Huxley is generally regarded as the founder of transhumanism, coining the term in an article written in 1957. Quote, Up till now, human life has generally been, as Hobbes described it, nasty, brutish and short. The great majority of human beings, if they have not already died young, have been afflicted with misery. We can justifiably hold the belief that these lands of possibility exist, and that the present limitations and miserable frustrations of our existence could be in large measure surmounted. The human species can, if it wishes, transcend itself. Not just sporadically, an individual here in one way, an individual there in another way, but in its entirety, as humanity. The definition differs, albeit not substantially, from the one commonly in use since the 1980s. The ideas raised by these thinkers were explored in the science fiction of the 1960s, notably in Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey, in which an alien artifact grants transcendent power to its wielder. Do you see the way forward into a bright new future being one where your body becomes obsolete and your consciousness reduced to a data stream. Superintelligence means any form of artificial intelligence that is capable of outclassing the best human brains in practically every discipline, including scientific creativity, practical wisdom and social skills. Several commentators have argued that both the hardware and the software required for superintelligence might be developed in the first few decades of the next century. Lifelong emotional well-being through recalibration of the pleasure centers. Mild variants of sustainable euphoria are possible for a minority of people who respond especially well to antidepressants. Pharmaceuticals currently under development promise to give an increasing number of normal people the choice of drastically reducing the incidence of negative emotions in their lives. In some cases, the adverse side effects of the new agents are negligible. Whereas street drugs typically wreak havoc on the brain's neurochemistry, producing a brief emotional high followed by a crash, modern clinical drugs may target a given neurotransmitter, thereby avoiding any negative effects on the sub subject's cognitive faculties. He or she won't feel drugged, and it enables a constant, indefinite, indefinitely sustainable mood elevation without being addictive, as cleaner and safer mood brighteners and gene therapies become available. Paradise engineering may become a practical possibility. But what about personality pills? Drugs and gene therapy will yield far more than shallow one-dimensional pleasure. They can also modify personality. They can help overcome shyness, eliminate jealousy, increase creativity and enhance the capacity for empathy and emotional depth. Think of all the preaching, fasting and self-discipline that people have subjected themselves to throughout the ages in attempts to improve their character. Shortly, it may become possible to achieve the same goals much more thoroughly by swallowing a daily cocktail pill. Nanotechnology is the hypothetical design and manufacture of machines to atomic scale precision, including general purpose assemblers, devices that can position atoms individually in order to build almost any chemically permitted matter configuration for which we can give a detailed specification, including exact copies of themselves. This would make possible dirt cheap but perfectly clean production of almost any commodity given the design, specification and the requisite input of energy and atoms. The issue is how to build this first assembler. Two approaches are under consideration. One of them builds on what nature has achieved and seeks to use biochemistry to engineer new proteins that can serve as tools in further engineering efforts. 
The other attempts to build atomic structures from scratch using atomic force microscopes to position atoms one by one on a surface. The two methods can potentially be used in conjunction. Vastly extending lifespans, it may prove feasible to use radical gene therapy and other biological methods to block the normal aging processes and to stimulate rejuvenation and repair ne mechanisms indefinitely. It's also possible that nothing short of nanotechnology will do the trick. Meanwhile, there are unproven and expensive hormone treatments that seem to have some effect on general vitality in elderly people, although as yet nothing has been shown to be more effective at life extension than controlled calorific restriction. The Interconnected World Even in, in its present form, the internet has an immense impact on some people's lives, and its ramifications are just beginning to unfold. This is one area where radical change is quite widely perceived and where media discussion has been extensive. Uploading of our consciousness into a virtual reality. If we could scan the synaptic pathways of a human brain and simulate it on, on a computer, then it would be possible for us to migrate from our biological bodies to a purely digital framework. We could engineer totally new types of experience. Uploading, in this sense, would probably require mature nanotechnology. But there are less extreme ways of fusing the human mind with computers. Work is being done today on developing neuro-chip interfaces. The technology is still in the early stages, but it might one day enable us to build neuro-substrate interfaces meaning we could directly plug in to cyberspace. The various schemes for immersive virtual reality, for instance, using head-mounted displays that communicate with the brain via our natural sense organs. Reanimation of cryogenically suspended patients. Persons frozen from today's procedure can probably not be brought back to life with anything less than mature nanotechnology. Even if we could be absolutely sure that mature nanotechnology will one day be developed, there would still be no guarantee that the cryonics customers' gamble would succeed. Perhaps the beings of the future won't be interested in reanimating present-day humans. Still, even a 5% or 10% chance of success could make an Alcor contract a rational option for people who can afford it and who place a great value on their continued personal existence. Now, of course, a lot of this possible future is weighted in favour of the wealthy, the few, the tiny group of elite individuals who, thanks to the accident of birth or to the fruits of their hard work, will, whichever way they've made their money, be the target audience for these life-extending technologies. Though the, those of us without the great wealth that may well be required will be left behind. The digital divide will become the digital Grand Canyon, with the vast majority of us left looking across the canyon in wonder at the lives of the few. Now, this is being played out in the media with films like Elysium, and science fiction does play a massive role throughout transhumanism. The first self-described transhumanists met formally in the early 1980s at the University of California, Los Angeles, which became the main centre of transhumanist thought. Here, FM 2030, who was an author, teacher, transhumanist, philosopher, futurist and consultant, FM 2030 was born Faradian M. Esfandari. He lectured on his third way futurist ideology. At the EZTV media venue frequented by transhumanists and other futurists, Natasha Vita Moore presented Breaking Away, her 1980 experimental film with the theme of humans breaking away from their biological limitations and the Earth's gravity as they head into space. 
FM 2030 and Vita More soon began holding gatherings for transhumanists in Los Angeles, which included students from FM 2030's courses and audiences from Vita More's artistic productions. In 1982, Vita Moore authored the Transhumanist Arts Statement and, six years later, produced the cable TV show Trans Century Update on Transhumanity, a program which reached over 100,000 viewers. In 1986, Eric Drexler published Engines of Creation, The Coming Era of Nanotechnology, which discussed the prospects for nanotechnology and molecular assemblers, and founded the Foresight Institute. As the first non-profit organization to research, advocate for, and perform cryonics, the Southern California offices of the Alcor Life Extension Foundation became a center for futurists. In 1990, more a strategic philosopher created his own particular transhumanist doctrine, which took the form of the principles of extropy and laid the foundation of modern transhumanism by giving it a new definition. Transhumanism is a class of philosophies that seek to guide us towards a post-human condition. Transhumanism shares many elements of humanism including a respect for reason and science, and committed to progress and a valuing of human or transhuman existence in this life. Transhumanism differs from humanism in recognizing and anticipating the radical alterations in the nature and possibilities of our lives resulting from various sciences and technologies. So, do you be enhanced and improved? Or will you be left in your natural, as you came into the world, human body? Do you want, need, or desire to live forever? Can you imagine a life of conscious data, of machine bodies? If you can, then should the tech and software be made available to everyone who wants it? Or should it be the domain of the rich and powerful who can afford the upgrade which takes them far ahead of the rest of humanity. As always, the rights and wrongs are for you to decide. This is just a brief insight into a fascinating and morally challenging topic that has potential to enhance some and degrade others, or to benefit everyone by giving us all pain-free, worry-free eternal life. We hope that you'll be prompted to ask these questions and find your own answers and make up your own mind. You have 20 seconds to comply.